thanks again and uh Corey and uh for organizing and for all our panelists and uh uh, as mentioned, we're going to move on now on the agenda to our uh, uh, poster awards and presentations. And uh, I'm going to see if Kat Nikiel from Purdue is ready to take that over. Hi, Possibly. I am Maybe here. You can pin Kat. Super. Kat is uh, a winner from previous years as well as one of the major organizers. So take it away, Kat. Thanks. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure to highlight the great poster sessions that we had at MARTA this week. So as we all kind of learned throughout the week, uh, we've really been trying to highlight the importance of data work in material science. And so we do that by making awards for the best poster. And this is done in both the postdoc and student categories. So this year we had our largest poster participation ever. We had 20 presenters from seven different universities. And all of this is possible thanks to the help of about a dozen judges. And I'd also like to thank our full student organizational panel. So from Purdue, that would be myself Ethan, and Ethan Holbrook, as well as some advice from Juan Carlos Redusco, who recently graduated. And then from Johns Hopkins, we had Jocko Banerjee and Shaza Alotaibi. And because of everyone involved, we felt we were able to identify some particularly strong and interesting work. And this judging is really important because the awards for best poster each come with a $500 check to thank and encourage ongoing focus in data-centric materials work. So with that out of the way, I can go ahead and introduce the poster session winners. So for the best poster in the postdoc category, our winner was Vineeth Venugopal. I don't know if they're in the meeting as of now, um, but they are from MIT. And their poster was on MAT KG2, which is Unveiling Precise Materials Ontology through Autonomous Committees of LLMs. And then our best poster from the grad student category was Rushik Desai from Purdue University for their poster on Multi-Component, Multi-Phase Perovskite Database. And we are a little early on the poster sessions, but if either of them are on call, they each have some time to present their work to everyone. Looks like Vineeth is there. Vineeth, you want to go first? Yeah, sounds good. Um, let me share my screen, please. Uh, can you see my screen? Awesome. Uh, Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vineeth, and I'm. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this prize. Um, I'm humbled and happy. Um, my work is on unveiling precise materials ontology through autonomous committees of LLM. I'm a postdoc with uh, Elsa Olivetti at MIT. She has been an amazing mentor, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank her for her constant guidance, which has been immense. Um, my work is on developing an autonomous knowledge graph in the field of material science. Um, and the motivation for this work really came from the observation that today you could go to Google and pretty much ask any random question. So I could say, how tall is Kim Kardashian? And Google not just gives me an answer, but also shows her picture and tells me how tall her siblings are, which I didn't even ask for. Um, at the same time, if I ask Google which metals are magnetic, it seems to think it knows the answer. But if you look at it closely, the answers are not entirely right. For one, it's giving me a lot of metals that are not magnetic. But more importantly, it's missing iron, the quintessential magnetic metal. Uh, this is not just a problem with Google. I believe it's a problem with our field as a whole that we do not have easy and efficient access to a lot of uh, questions that we would think are common sense. So if I say, what are the properties of graphene oxide or list all materials that are thermoelectric, uh, there is no easy way in which we can get this answer other than by talking to a domain expert or going through a textbook or a review paper. We think that a knowledge graph would be a good solution for this problem, both because of the way that data is organized 
uh, in a graph database as opposed to a tabular database and because knowledge graphs have relationships that help us track from one entity to the other. Uh, so this led to the development of what we are now calling MATKG1. Um, the way that MATKG1 was developed is that we used a bird-based NER model to classify different tokens in a document into one of the seven categories shown here. Um, finding entities was easy, but finding relationships proved to be much harder. So what we did in MATKG is that we just established uh, statistical relationships between entities. So let's say you had FE203 and Catalyst in a document. We just clubbed together their NER categories and defined that as a relationship. Uh, but we did qualify this with the number of documents in which these terms co-occurred, which we call the co-occurrence frequency. So this served as a weighing parameter that was a proxy for how confident we were in that particular relationship. So altogether, MADKG has around 70,000 entities and 6.5 million relations. We have made the code based and the full data set available at the QR code shown here. Uh, now, obviously, the main problem with this approach is the relationship. Uh, because of the statistical nature, they, they are more correlations than they are causations. And so MADKG2 aims to solve this problem by using large language models to extract uh, more high fidelity relationships. And the way we do this is that we gave the entities and the context, which we already have from the first uh, knowledge graph that we extracted, uh, and a large language model was asked to make a classification from a given set of relationships. Now, the problem with this approach in turn is that a single large language model can hallucinate. So instead, we found that having multiple large language models uh, do this classification in parallel and then aggregating the relationship from all of them simultaneously was in fact a much better method. Uh, the idea being that uh, all large language models cannot hallucinate at the same time. So if you have an ensemble, the hallucinations tend to cancel each other. And we did find that uh, in the in the prototype that we have studied so far, the ensemble approach did perform better than any single large language model. Um, now, quickly, uh, since I'm running out of time, uh, we are able to see that MATKG is able to capture the top applications, properties, etc., of different materials. Uh, another application of MATKG is uh, since the data is extracted from a finite number of documents, the data is inherently incomplete, but using graph-based uh, knowledge uh, link completion task, we can then uh, do a link prediction on these entities and we can find relations in knowledge graphs that might be missing from the uh, from the original database. Uh, with that, I will conclude now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vineet. I think now we will be having Rishik present the grad student poster. Uh, yeah, so hi. So what I've tried to done with this project uh, is come up with a workflow that can be used to um, used to store high throughput based DFT perovskite data uh, in a FAIR format. So perovskites have been this materials of interest uh, since the past few decades for their photovoltaic and photocatalytic properties. And high throughput DFT studies have quickly become a popular way to screen this compound since they uh, can exist in a large chemical space. But what lacks is uh, like a foundational database which can easily store all of the all of this high throughput studies in a fair format here fair meaning findable accessible interoperable and reproducible so the main aim of why we decided to come up with a workflow for perovskite materials is because uh, in the past few years graduate students at professor manode's group have done various high throughput studies with different kinds of perovskite exploring the exploring the chemical space which is shown and furthermore uh, the data also the simulations also contained perovskites with different types of a b and excite mixing 
along with different kinds of crystal systems and different uh, levels of theory which were explored so since we had such a such such a depth depthful database we decided to uh, design a sim tool on nanohub to store all of this data um, in a fair format so what i did was take all of this uh, vast prans which are over 2000 and parse it through Atomate 2, which is a Python-based package developed by uh, people over at Materials Project, which gives you out a task document, which has all of the inf which has like multitude of information about what the simulation is, but which is not exactly easily interpretable, and that's where the sim tool comes in. So the sim tool takes this task document and converts it into the outputs which are important for a particular perovskite run. Uh, which includes both the structure parameters, the properties such as band gap, energies, forces, and the solar limiting maximum efficiency, as well as the simulation parameters. And then it stores it in a open source uh, open source database, uh, which can be easily queried through Python based API. So the main aim here was uh, to generate such amount such form of data which is easily machine readable since we also have a lot of machine learning uh, based and ensemble based models, which we do work with regularly. So this database can also be an effective way to train such kind of models. Furthermore, anyone who is looking to demonstrate the capabilities of machine learning based models in, in material science can make use of this tool and the database uh, to showcase how data can be used for different machine learning models. Yeah. And that's about it. Thank you. Great, thank you to both of our poster session presenters. Thanks, that was great. And thank you, Kat. So uh, that brings us up to the end of the meeting and uh, our summary and a couple of final great announcements, announcements about the council. So. Uh, Kate Brinson, who's on the council and the executive committee of the council, is going to close for us. Kate, did you get back in the meeting? You ready to share? Kate was migrating from uh, iPad yes. to iPad. Perfect. I think I did. It. I think I did it. I'm on right. my laptop now. So and let I'll me pass see. it over to Kate. Austin, you want to spotlight Kate and her share? And there we go. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. Yeah. So let me see if I can possibly do this and share my. Um, I guess my desktop share, maybe that works. Do you see slides? We do see some slides. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, let me put it into, is that presenter mode prepper? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so then, um, I have a, Little summary here. This is the four, the six, sorry, the six sessions that we um, uh, had over the past few days that were really incredible. I'm not going to try to give all of my detailed bullet point summaries of them, but we had a great opening on uh, open materials data and AI, where we talked a lot about um, some big open data resources, issues of standardization, um, and the complexity of interoperability. There was a really interesting session on uh, large language models for data extraction and coding, and then also for learning, and that came back again in the sixth session. Um, really nice session on AI-ready data, where we also talked about how workflows and codes also need to be included. And it was in this session that I think a comment was made, made that we need the material project for other systems like polymers, um, which I think is great. Uh, there was a fantastic session on the working groups that are doing amazing job here um, uh, as part of Marta and Martian. Um, and we have some great sessions coming on that, as well as some white papers that will be released for the current working groups. Um, and then we have new working groups coming. So and I think there's a slide on that here at the end. And um, industry and translation was a really fascinating uh, discussion and panel. Um, there were some comments about that uh, how large data sets enable model generaliz generalization. There was lots of discussion about uh, um, data uh, data security and data rights and how we have to manage that in this process of translation. And importantly, there was an interesting discussion on how you have to think about the possible end user if you're going to be translating 
your research into something that's actually used, that you need to be thinking about those end users, even when you're just doing the fundamental research, because there's different things, that, different aspects that need to be considered. Um, and then the last session that we just heard on workforce development was uh, really inspiring. Um, and this is so important at all levels from K through 12, um, all the way through our uh, undergraduates, uh, masters and PhD students and beyond to profess working professionals. And here LLMs reared their head again and there was a lot of discussion about how to use LLMs for teaching coding or for uh, teaching critical concepts as part of materials. So I think this was a, a really inspiring workshop and I hope that people um, really enjoyed it as well. So now it is um, my, uh, uh, um, I guess, uh, pleasure, but also with some sadness that I, that I announce uh, a few departures from the MARTA Council. So these are all people that have been part of MARTA from the very beginning. Um, Laura Bartolo and Peter Voorhees, both at Northwestern and part of CHIMAD. Ellen DeGuire, who was American Ceramic Society, has been in indispensable in helping us get going and produce a real society. Um, and a Purva Meta at um, uh, the Stanford Synchro Lab and Slack um, uh, uh, lent um, you know, many important aspects to uh, the group over the past years. Um, and so we really appreciate all that they have done for, uh, for MARTA, um, everything from coordinating working groups to writing bylaws, um, organizing these meetings, um, and they will be missed, but they will still be uh, part of some of the ongoing efforts, especially with Martian. And so we look forward to seeing them uh, continue to be part of MARTA as they leave the council. Um, and then I get to um, have the distinct pleasure of announcing a few of our new um, MARTA council members. These are people that were elected. There were, you may have received a, some, a ballot for this um, and may have voted. So I have a few slides on these people. I won't read every word on the slide, um, but I will just announce the people um, and go through it. We tried to have a, uh, a balanced, um, uh, distribution of people on the board. So there are people from national labs, um, from, uh, um, as well as from academia and from industry um, to balance the, the leadership in the council. So Linda Sapachek, many of us know, um, uh, was a, a amazing uh, a director of the materials research division for years and um, has recently retired and uh, in, uh, I, I, in her newfound spare time, we'll be spending uh, some of that here with us um, on the council at MARTA. And so we really look forward to her insight. Um, Nicholas Schwartz um, at Argonne uh, National Lab um, uh, will also be joining the council with his expertise on uh, supercomputing as well as experimental and observational facilities um, at the Advanced Photon Source. Um, Jake Yeston um, is an editor for uh, physical sciences research at Science, and uh, many of us may have interacted with him on our papers over the years. Um, I think it's really great to have uh, somebody from a, a major journal here on the council um, as uh, fair data um, is part of the research that we do get that gets published in journals, and they're, they're an enormous stakeholder in this space, so really happy to have him here as well. Um, Corinne Lipscomb um, participated in one of the last uh, MARDA um, annual uh, uh, meetings, maybe a couple meetings ago. She is at 3M, um, uh, uh, has expertise um, that ranges from materials informatics to bioinformatics um, um, and does a lot of uh, strategic work with R&D um, for uh, 3M. Um, and the new healthcare company, Solventum. And so her insight will be also um, excellent to have on the council. And I think this might be the last one. Jane Greenberg um, is a professor at um, Drexel University in computing and inf informatics, um, um, uh, has uh, done research in metadata, um, semantics, uh, data science, and information economics. Uh, this brings an incredible uh, breadth to the board, and we really welcome her expertise here as well. Um, nope, there was one more, Taylor Sparks, um, who is at University of Utah, um, and has also participated in one of these prior um, MARTA annual meetings as a, as a speaker or panelist, um, has a 
really uh, interesting uh, work uh, in data mining, uh, has published uh, benchmark data sets, um, is also associate editor, editor for uh, data in brief and computational material science. So we really look forward to his expertise as well. And then here at the end, and David, let me know if I'm forgetting uh, to mention anything. I want to mention a few things that are coming up for MARTA in the coming um, months. Uh, first, um, in late April, there will be a second large language model hackathon, hackathon that will be happening. Uh, the first one was last year, which was a huge success. Uh, ben organized that as well. Um, so watch for that. I'm sure it'll be advertised on uh, appropriate social media channels, um, but you can also reach out to Ben if you'd like to get advanced information on it. Um, in July, um, sort of early to mid-July, um, there will be a SciPy in the in Tacoma session on materials and chemistry. Dan Wheeler is the contact information, and there's a link there on the screen that you can go to for more information. And then um, at, towards the end of July, there will be an in-person uh, workshop in DC. The um, details will be forthcoming. Um, David has been coordinating this, um, and this should be a, a really nice meeting. Um, one of the, I guess the very first meeting that was forming MARTA was an actual in-person meeting, but since then everything has been online because we, we were sort of birthed um, with the COVID pandemic. Um, so this will be the first time that we get together in person uh, uh, since, uh, since the very beginning. So that'll be great. Um, and that uh, July 29th um, um, workshops that'll be held will be in conjunction with the MGIPI meeting that'll be also in Washington. And so that may be a convenient uh, opportunity to travel a day early and come to the MARTA workshops um, in advance of that MGIPI meeting. So with that, I really want to thank everyone for their participation, um, uh, all the panelists for their incredible um, uh, uh, insights and uh, their time, uh, the organizers and the, um, the uh, uh, session, um, the, um, forgetting the right word, the people who ran the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole meeting, including uh, 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 Debbie Aldous, um, uh, uh, Corey Oasis um, and David Albert for all of his help as well. And David, mm -hmm. who else am I forgetting uh, to mention? Fati Sen from Novellus. Oh, Fati Sen from Novellus, yes. Corey, yes. Fati and Debbie who worked really tireless, tirelessly and of course, Selena in communications for so much. Right, yep, thank you, thank you. I knew I was forgetting something. Yeah, I didn't have my, didn't have my notes up since I moved everything to my laptop then my cheat sheet isn't in front of me. Um, but I think then uh, I've covered almost everything and uh, delighted to have had everybody here. And David, if you have anything else to say, please uh, step in. And no, otherwise we will be, we will be yeah. done. You've done a great job. Thank you, Kate. Thanks to everyone. And thanks to membership for showing up. Um, we're hoping to increase programming as you can see from this slide uh, to keep engagement going and uh, spin some of these ideas out into exciting new working groups. So Thank you all. And uh, I think we're adjourned. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all.